Fire and our unique relationship to it sets us apart from all other life on the planet. Our early relationship with fire was one of need, appreciation, and wonder. Fire, like the earth, sustained us, nourished us, and empowered us. Regardless of culture, fire was rooted in our earliest and subsequent evolution. Ever present and ever useful. My name is Jab Bernakovic, and over the last decade, I've helped to design and implement resilient and regenerative landscapes all over the world. I live in fire prone British Columbia, Canada. The province of British Columbia is big. At 944,735 kilometers squared, it's bigger than fire prone California, Washington, and Montana combined. And with 55 million hectares of trees, much of which has been killed by mountain pine beetle, it's a very fire prone place to live. Each new fire season breaks more records than the last. Record breaking has become the new norm. By all appearances, we're at war with fire. Fire has become a perceived enemy. How did we get here? What caused our relationship with fire to change? And more practically, what can we do about it? You can't research fire for very long before you find this guy, Stephen Pine, a firefighter, fire researcher, and now fire historian. Stephen wrote the book, or should I say books, about wildfire. The current scene, to reduce it to its simplest formula, is that we have too much bad fire, too little good fire, and too much combustion overall. And we're not going to be able to handle the too much combustion overall for a long time. We're left with feral flames, which is what we've got. I don't even think of them as wildfires anymore. They're feral. It was once a landscape that was, as far as fire goes, at least partially domesticated, and now is not. Stephen's comments made me think of David Holmgren, an ecological designer and co-founder of Permaculture, an approach to work with instead of against nature. We now acknowledge that the indigenous people were managing the landscapes to a degree that they are really actually ancient cultural landscape. A great example is the tall grass prairie. If you don't burn, for five, six, seven years, woody plants will take over and that grassland will disappear. That grassland had to be burned at least, say, every three years or even more often to keep it in grass, to maintain that. They can move the bison and other animals around by how they burn because the bison will go to the freshly burned area. There was a famous debate in 1910, how should we base our fire policy? Formal debate in some ways and there was a whole group that said we should be copying the American Indian. Fire is used to cleanse our ecosystem, to care for our animals, our basket materials, our medicinal plants, our foods, our traditional foods. Um, I was taught that as true human beings, it's our responsibility to care for the earth and everything on it. That ended with contact. Those societies were broken, diseases, as well as war and relocations broke down that old patterning of burning, because what really matters with fire is the, the arrangement of fire on the landscape. We lost thousands, in some cases hundreds, but in many cases thousands of years of empirical experience dealing with fire in the landscape. That was lost around the world, and it's been very hard to recover it. Not only did we lose millions of First Nations that knew North America like the back of their hand and managed it with sophisticated detail, with colonization came massive deforestation. Industrialized fire like locomotives acted like fuses, carrying sparks into a landscape thirsty for flame and loaded with fuel. In the 19th century, the whole settlement period is one of massive fires. I mean, orders, an order of magnitude larger than the mega fires we've seen in recent decades. European imperialism was also the vector for industrialization that really unhinged lots and lots of landscape. And it left enormous amounts of forest slash on the ground. And that was the performance enhancer, if you will. 1910, they got hit with big blow up. In the Northern Rockies, three and a quarter million acres, a complex of fires traumatized the Forest Service. And after that, they were determined they would never have another fire like 1910 on their watch. For the next 50 years, we try to take out fire from the landscape any kind of fire. And World War II militarizes it as well. Fire is hostile fire. Your fires, their secret weapon, diverting all of that war surplus equipment into firefighting was a real mistake. I mean, it was a tremendous asset, 
but all it does is reinforce this sense that with enough mechanical muscle and a kind of wartime mentality and mobilization, we can, we can fight this. Our society's mentality around fire changed. We started to fight fire, seeing it as the enemy contributed to a century of fuel buildup. It's a mentality we're still fighting today. This is Dan Halsey. He's also an ecological designer. And for him, this dangerous mentality started when he was just a kid. As a child growing up with Smokey the Bear, a lot of it was what we were told. Every forest fire is bad. Any fire that happens basically out in the wilderness needs to be put out because it's destroying life. The problem with that is that when you have millions of people told that the fires need to go out and that fire is bad, psychologically, everybody now has this attitude about fire. We fell in love with our ability to suppress fires and we really thought we were doing the right thing to put them all out. But what we were doing was a pay me now or pay me later. And we're now at the pay me later stage and the price is gonna be pretty high. In the affluent countries around the world where people have shifted into urban areas from rural areas, become disconnected from nature, begun to live more effectively from the oil well and its derivatives than from the land itself, then that means there's been this huge vacating of the landscape and reduction in use of what the landscape produces. And what landscapes produce everywhere the most is biomass. The regrowth of trees, the regrowth of grasslands that are not, no longer grazed by grazing animals. Of course, that huge biomass builds up and becomes fuel for fires. Well, we're just playing whack-a-mole with fires and they're going to get bigger, going to get more expensive. If we continue this war metaphor, which is the worst of all metaphors for fire. I mean, a great saying, fire, fire is the best of friends and the worst of enemies. We are not at war with fire and that's good because if we were, we're going to take a lot of casualties, we're going to spend a lot of money, and we're going to lose. We sweat when summer comes. You know, the drier it is, the more worried we are. It is ready to burn. It is past ready to burn. So every summer, it's, oh my god, is it going to be this summer that it reaches me? From a personal and, and a human standpoint, these fires are very, very scary. But from an ecological standpoint, they're really, really essential. We have a flammable life. Practically everything we own melts, burns, gives off toxic gas. Most of that is because it comes from petroleum. Everything we own basically becomes toxic as soon as you add a flame. Where do they think that that's gonna end? All of the stuff that we put down on the ground and into the environment ends up in our water. It ends up in our animals. It ends up in us. I don't see how our science can build up in a handful of years or even a couple of decades, anything like the amount of knowledge that we would have had of living for hundreds of thousands of years on these landscapes and using fire. I think if we let people talk, people who are actually doing this, this is their life, we would capture a lot of knowledge and a lot of values that are lost because we think we have to take it into the lab, into the lecture hall. From what I can gather, humanity has a solid track record of reacting to threats. But what if for a moment, instead of reacting, we thought about being proactive? What if the response to wildfire was, what are you trying to tell us? These wildfires are a feedback loop from deforesting our continent, draining the watersheds, removing the animals that made our continent lush with vegetation and water, stopping all natural fires that regenerated the forest, and allowing trees and shrubs to go past when they would have historically burned becoming the fuel for the wildfires we experience today. It seems the message is clear. Interrupting the cycle of wildfire doesn't work for us or the land. With a rapidly changing climate, perhaps it's time to change, in kind, the climate between our ears. Instead of only suppressing fire, it seems we need to be part of a culture that embraces fire. There's potential for a lot of forest fires in the next couple of years happening if we don't do our jobs, when I say we, I'm talking about myself as a firekeeper and the wildfire companies and uh, BC Forestry, Uber's involved 
and looking after our mother, we all need to work together. And we all need to get rid of this fear of fire. A lot of people don't like prescribed fire because there's smoke. But what they don't realize is that when there's wildfire, there is smoke so thick you can't see the sun for weeks on end. And when there's a controlled burn, it's also controlled smoke. So you have smoke for a day, it goes away in the evening. The next day you do a controlled burn again. So are we going to choose to sit back and do nothing and wait for the next wildfire to hit? Or are we gonna take action and put some fire purposely on the land to not only protect our homes, but to restore the ecosystem? We just did a prescribed burn three weeks ago. It was totally black. And we drive by now and you look and it's all green. In that short amount of time, there's new ferns coming up. There's new grass coming up. There's deer in those places that we burn. It is our responsibility and it should be our right to use fire. I think the fear that people have needs to be set down. Work with someone in a fire agency or talk with them, you know, see how they see it and then come spend time with us when we do a prescribed burn and realize that Native peoples don't fight fires. We light fires and we do that for a reason because somewhere along the line, somebody is going to say, oh my God, there's a light bulb moment. They actually knew what they were talking about. I hadn't been on radio communication with anyone in a minute and knew there was fire around me and wasn't really sure what the land looked like below me and was kind of trapped in some bushes and, and it was holding the flame. And I just realized that I wasn't afraid because nobody in that situation had set me up to be afraid because we all felt so good about getting fire on the land in a good way and it had been so carefully planned the right time based on some weather monitoring observations and their cultural knowledge of when is the right time to burn and their ability to read the landscape and the weather. It's an all hands on deck situation and we need everyone in their backyards and their communities coming together to light fires because the solutions are decentralized and localized and can't, cannot be generalized. Each region has a specific prescription for how to bring fire to that land and it's up to the people of that specific place to work together to bring fire there or fire will come. There's a longer history of putting slow and low intensity fires in the landscape than there is of bigger industrial prescribed burns or suppressing fire. Beyond the necessary task of putting fire back in the landscape, which to me now seems obvious, how do we manage the risk of living in a landscape that has to burn? John Bailey from the University of California starkly shows how intensive grazing with sheep reduces vegetation, feeds livestock, employs locals, and decreases the potential of land to burn. As opposed to where animals like sheep, goats, and cattle weren't used to graze or browse before wildfire struck. The land needs to be managed for fire. The preferences and the personal preferences and the romantic idea of living in the mountains and having these trees all around you uh, is not a plan. Uh, it's not working with the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation, if you have the wrong kind of tree and you're not managing the land, you're not cleaning up the understory of lots of dry tinder, you're basically surrounding your house and your land with fuel. It's again back to managing your resources and understanding that you may want this lifestyle. And of course, we're very uh, aesthetically driven people. We want it to look a certain way because it helps us feel a certain way. And when you're sold that kind of pattern, it's very difficult to then change that. For the realtors, for the developers, they put in these houses and they're surrounding them with all these trees because that's what was sold and that's the idea of beauty. Whereas, practically speaking, it actually need to have quite a bit of space between your flammable life and the rest of the ecosystem, which is dependent again on fire. Dan's words struck home. These landscapes have to burn, but our homes, farms, and towns don't. With proper fire mitigation strategies, we can reduce our risk of burning. But because of my background in land design, I kept coming back to the unconventional approaches of people who work with instead of against nature. Taking their lead from their local environment to design their landscapes and their lives to be resilient. 
personal and household resilience, rebuilding some sense that we are here in this place, wherever that place is, we take responsibility for our own well-being. Where is our water coming from? Where is our food coming from? What are the forces that affect this site, whether that be the threat of wildfire or flood or whatever it is? And lowering the expectation of how much uh, those things will be provided for us by professionals, by authority, managed on our behalf. We have designed Maliadora to be a safe haven to stay and defend, while recognising that our active defence of the property and ultimately the house would be the most significant factor beyond all of the water systems, the fire retardant vegetation all of the other things. But these preparations, these design features, are in fact part of a psychological preparation to give yourself confidence. On the other side of the world, a farm thrives in a place it shouldn't, 1,100 to 1,400 metres above sea level in the Austrian Alps. The Kermaterhof has a number of terraces that hold 72 ponds and narrow fields that slow, spread and sink rain, feeding a cornucopia of fruit, deciduous and conifer trees, not to mention crops. The farm's vegetation mimics an old growth forest that's experienced wildfire. The understory is clear of overgrowth and naturally irrigated by an intact watershed, making the farm fire resilient and productive. Created by farmer Sepp Holzer, the farm's success reached all the way to Portugal. There in 2007, he helped create a water retention landscape that made a three-acre lake built as fire protection to the local authorities. The landscape provides the burgeoning community of Tamara agricultural production that not only feeds the community, but also protects them against wildfire. As former Santa Barbara Fire Chief Eric Peterson said after the 2017 Thomas Fire in California, agriculture has been proven to be a valuable buffer in a firefight. It may sound silly to say, but tomatoes have a hard time burning. Integrating and incentivizing agriculture closer to home increases not only our fire, but also our food resilience, if we embrace our farmers. An eclectic farmer from Australia, P.A. Yeomans, applied his background to a very personal problem. During a 1943 fire in New South Wales, he lost his farm and brother-in-law to fire. He developed a design system that observed and worked within the local climate, dividing the land into small watersheds to store and collect water that produced trees and pasture. Uniquely, his approach was to try to look at land intelligently and let the land tell me what I should do about it. He also used a specialized plow in concert with specific layout of plants and trees to further slow, spread, and sink water, creating soil rich in carbon and water holding capacity, producing a fire resilient landscape that promoted perennial agriculture and settlement. His key line design system demonstrated at his farm, Yobarni, produced 8 million liters of water per hectare. That's more than enough water in one of the most fire prone areas in the world to do almost any kind of agriculture. As with many things that are lost over time, our relationship with fire changed along the way, from one of reliance and respect, to one of fear, avoidance, and ultimately complete misunderstanding. But as I found out, it's never too late to change. You see, fires like water, with mismanagement, either can become a problem. But when I realized that like water, fire is life, fire and my relationship to it took a turn for the better. With this mindset, 120 years of wildfire history, and using nature as a guide, I found people and places that didn't just talk, but actively demonstrated that our wildfire situation isn't hopeless. It doesn't need to be the new normal. Yes, we have over a century of fuel buildup and we need to address it. And yes, some of our ancestors made poor decisions, but that doesn't mean we have to. Standing on the shoulders of those who've lived well with fire, we can rebuild a modern culture of fire to address the global forests and climates we've inherited. Passing on a legacy to our children to create a future that embraces fire. To learn more about being a part of the culture of fire, visit facingfirefilm.com for more resources, interviews, tools, and techniques.
time that Smokey retired. You know, people hate Smokey being disrespected and trashed, and a lot of critics of fire like to do that, and the public hates it. Uh, so let Smokey retire with dignity, give him a gold shovel and a hearty handshake and the thanks of a grateful nation, and let him trundle off to his cabin in the woods, and his two cubs take over to light fires and fight fires. And they can spread the message. It's time for a new generation to take over.